Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hello, it's Sean, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. There was a point when we hit a profit of $10,000 a month, and I was very rattled. Back when we started Psychotactics, we had few expectations. We had just moved to New Zealand, we would bought a house, then we bought another, which was a rental, and our goal was centered around paying off those mortgages to pay off whatever bills we had, and about $3,000 was enough to cover most of our needs, and yet the income was steadily rising to the point where we crossed $10,000 for the first time ever. And it was exhilarating, but also quite unnerving. The first thought that crossed my mind was, how can we reach that figure again? The second thought was remarkably similar. It was, will we ever reach that figure again? I was naive, of course. I was benchmarking my life like most magazines and blogs do. All around us, the signals are about increasing sales, doubling or trebling the income, rising to the top of some crazy ladder. The fact that that $10,000 figure was so disturbing caused us to sit down and to evaluate what we wanted from life. And it didn't take long. The list was simple. It comprised, as you'd guess, of three things. The first is unadulterated free time. The second was how to treat money, which was like oxygen. And finally, how to reclaim our hobbies. Let's start out at the top like we always do. We'll start out with the first one, which is what is unadulterated free time? Most days, I tend to head to the cafe shortly after lunch. It is just one of the cafes I frequent, and this one is closer to home. So I have my book, I have my iPad, and I have between two or three hours of free time. On weekends, I avoid email or any kind of assignments, preferring instead to do whatever I please. And then there are those three months that you know of, which is what this podcast is named after, and we tend to travel, and we are completely disconnected from any sort of work. So when you add up all of those hours of the cafe and the three-month vacations and then the weekends, it's a heck of a lot of free time. The weekends total to about 80 days in a year, the three months about 90 days, and then all of those cafe sessions we end up with around 170 to 190 free days in a year. It doesn't take very long to figure out that's more than half the year. But why are breaks such an important barometer of success? At least for me, the people who are busy all the time are not productive. It's a personal view, of course, but I don't believe that productivity and busyness are related. To be able to take such an enormous amount of time in the year we have to be able to do the same or even more work without compromising on our standards or without letting our clients down. So when we sit down at the end of the year, or maybe the start of the new year, we do our plans and the breaks become the real measurement device. If we can't take those breaks, it means that we are inefficient in many areas. When we can take those breaks, and we've done so consistently since 2004, then we know that we are doing just fine. The breaks are more than just a mere boast. It might seem a little obnoxious to say we take more than half a year off. But the reason that we got into business, the reason that you get into business, the reason why most people get into business is to have more control over their lives. If we are always at work, that doesn't sound like a lot of control at all. 
Plus, as you're likely to find out, breaks do more than just get you away from work. They get you away from home. Your home, my home, all the homes, it's the land of responsibility. The moment most of us tend to wake up, we have a barrage of things that we have to do. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, garbage, dishes, bills, and then there's work on top of all of that stuff. When you're away from home, all of those responsibilities are transferred to someone else. The brain not only gets a change in scene, but the sheer lack of needing to plan or do anything at all is just heavenly. You can sleep in, you can wake up, you can run around, you can do jolly well what you please. So it gives your mind a much needed rest and the body a catch up on the sleep. Not that you can catch up on sleep anyway, but you get some more sleep. And I've noticed this on vacations. I'll sleep quite a lot when I get there and then slowly that battery starts to get filled, filled, filled. And then by the time we're done with that break, I'm so eager to get back. I'm so eager to meet with clients, to get on 5000 BC, which is our membership site. I am totally eager. And I've seen this for people who truly take a break. Not people who are checking the email all the time while they're away, but people who truly take a break. And that's what it does. It gives you that reinforcement, that recharge to come back and then to take on your work with lots of gusto. And admittedly, not all of us can take this break. So it's important, at least in the day, to have time when you do absolutely nothing. As I said, it wasn't always the case with us. When we started out our business, we felt compelled to be at work seven days a week. We didn't like it, but we felt compelled to be there. And then several years later, as our business started settling down, we ran into other problems, other personal problems. We had to help with my niece, Marsha, who needed mentoring. And that took up an enormous part of the day. But even if your life doesn't have a huge amount of ups and downs, even if there is no big health problem or personal problem or kid problem or any problem, you're still going to have to do a whole bunch of things. In our business, we have courses like the article writing course. And for that duration, those three months, I can do pretty much nothing. A single course with about 18 students turns out about 10,000 posts. Yeah, that 10,000 figure comes up again, but 10,000 posts. So you don't get much time in a day to do what you have to do. That challenge of carving out free time, it's always there, it's persistent, it's, it's sometimes overbearing. You somehow have to have that free time. We all have different situations, realities, responsibilities. But long before we thought about money, we thought about the time. How can we make more time for this life that we have? And that was the first question. That was our first benchmark of success. Which takes us to the second part, which is about money. Because, hey, we all have to earn that money. It's the fuel of our business. So how do we go about it? Well, we treat money like oxygen. There are three kinds of people when it comes to money. The first kind of person doesn't have enough and thinks about it a lot. The second kind of person has more than enough and is more or less happy with their situation. And the third is super rich, super successful, has exorbitant amounts and thinks about money all the time. Our benchmark of success is to be in the second box because it feels just like how we go about our daily life. In other words, it feels like oxygen. When you look around, most of us aren't gasping for air. There's more than enough in the atmosphere. So that if we go outside or we're inside, we breathe naturally. 
But if you were somehow underwater, starved of oxygen, you'd be gasping for air all the time. And similarly, if money was one of the biggest benchmarks, it was one of the things that drove your ego, then you'd be gasping and gasping for more of that air all the time. So you find it on both ends of the spectrum, the people that are really struggling and the people that are really well off. And then there is that middle ground where you're happy. But we didn't know what that middle ground was. We didn't know what was more than enough. And so we couldn't set a benchmark for our success. However, around the year 2007, we hit a figure that was three times as much as we could spend. Hence, one third of our money went into our business, into our travel, into all of the expenses that you run into in every single year. One third went into taxes, which I am delighted to pay. And the final went into investments or savings. So this component of a third each this component of a third each gives us a framework of success. In the year 2000, we moved from Mumbai, India to Auckland, New Zealand, and we converted all of our life savings into New Zealand dollars. What did that conversion amount to? It was $70,000. And it may sound like a lot, and it is a decent amount, but it represented almost 20 years of cumulative savings, and it was being converted from one currency which was weaker, to a currency that was stronger. So you don't get a lot. You don't get at least the amount of stuff that you've saved over the years, that you've put away. Anyway, by the time we bought the car, we started to buy stuff for our house, that figure started going down very quickly. And we had to be careful about our money in a way that we had not done before. We got into a lot of trouble because we were spending so much money so quickly that we suddenly realized that we were going to be in trouble. Renuka sat me down one day with a piece of paper and showed me all the figures. And then we decided together that we were going to have a ridiculous fun budget of $150 a month. So we'd spend on the stuff that we needed, groceries and the things that were important. But if we wanted to eat out or spend on stuff that we liked, we had a cumulative, that's both of us, an upper limit of $150. A lot of money went into buying courses, into workshops on, on marketing and business. And at one point, I'd signed up to three workshops back to back. I spent over $10,000 on workshops alone. And then there were the books and the courses that we had bought. But when it came to ourselves, just spending money on fun, we limited it to just $150. I don't think Renuka was ever concerned that we'd make it, but I'm a sort of worrier, or at least I was back then, and I didn't want to worry about money. But because we were in that first category, I did think about it a lot. It took a lot of systems, education, and work to get to those first $10,000 a month. It's not like it's a benchmark, but that was... Wow. $10,000 in a single month. And it's at this point that we knew that we were well on our way. By the year 2007, we'd figured out our own principle of the three-part system. Unless our expenses increased dramatically, we didn't need to earn a lot more and we could have more free time. Our expenses did increase a bit. We stopped flying economy. We chose business class instead. Our choice of hotels and restaurant became slightly snooty. Even so, it wasn't a dramatic rise, and we were able to do just fine by keeping that principle of 3x. You know what that is, right? So one third goes here, one third goes there, and one third goes elsewhere. The key was not to become greedy. When you start a business, it's a lot like a flywheel. It starts up being slow and cumbersome. But if you do the right things, you get a lot of momentum. You're soon at the stage where you can earn many times the income that you've earned in the past. And things like fame and popularity, they become more prominent. 
Money becomes the driving factor in your life. You're always gasping for money, even though you have more than enough. You have more than enough fame. You still want more. You want to double, quadruple, quintuple everything. But there is a point at which you can't do any of that. You can only scale from one point onwards. You can buy more cars, bigger houses, bigger yachts, but you aren't getting richer in any way. It's just greater scale. That's all it is. In the desire to get even more oxygen, you're always gasping for the next big thing. Nothing seems enough and you're always scrambling for air. So it's not a place that we wanted to be in, so we chose that middle option. And once we were done with the free time and we'd worked out what the money situation was all about, there was one more important factor and this could not be ignored. Yet it is one of the things that gets ignored almost all the time. It's something that we forget. Even when things are hunky-dory and not choppy, we forget this one thing. What is it? It's about hobbies. And if you've been listening to this podcast, you know that we covered one about recalibrating your life. But I thought I'd sneak it in once again, just to remind you, just to remind me as well. Okay, let's go to the third part, reclaiming hobbies. Your cartoons are so good. You should sell them. You could easily make a book and make a fortune. Usually when I'm at the cafe, I have my paints, my moleskin book. Um, I'm painting and people come up to me and then they see my work and that's what they say. That we could sell a book, we could make a fortune, we'd be famous, blah, blah, blah. And in the beginning, I used to protest, but I realized that people are trying to be kind. They see that you're good at something, they appreciate your work, and they see a point where you could easily command an enhanced level of respect and probably a fortune, as they say. Which means that if you're good at cooking, they tend to think, oh, you should start up a restaurant. Or if you're good at making coffee, you need to start up a cafe. And to be fair, they're not entirely wrong, but everything in life doesn't need to be turned into fame or cash. A hobby doesn't need any external validation. A hobby is something personal that brings you great satisfaction, maybe even joy. Take, for example, my moleskin diaries. They are these little watercolor books, and they come blank, and then I fill them with paintings, paintings of what I do every day. But I didn't always keep this diary. Around the year 2010, I decided I wanted to paint, I liked to paint, but I was pretty hopeless at any sort of painting. Watercolors seemed like the most portable painting system, especially since we travel quite a bit. So I did what most people do. I went to the library, got some books, I looked up watercolor, then I went to a class nearby in Myrungi Bay, and then I went to the city, did another class, and then we did a trip to Cadaqués in Spain, a week of painting. But at no time did I think, oh, I should sell any of this work. And it's not like it will never happen. Maybe someday we'll put it in a book and maybe we'll sell the book. It doesn't have to make us famous or rich or anything. But that's the point of a hobby. A hobby doesn't need monetization. It doesn't even need anyone's approval. And this is the kind of thing that we need to reclaim. Of all the measures of success, this one, the hobbies, it seems to be the most frivolous of all. With all the things that we have to do, all the responsibilities that crowd out our calendar, surely a hobby is too much of a luxury. Yes, it is most certainly ostentatious to go back in time and to pick off where you left off, where you stopped doing whatever you enjoyed doing. That's clearly one of the hardest things to do. When I moved from cartooning to marketing, my friends thought I was stock raving mad because I was hopeless at marketing. I was extremely skilled at cartoons. I still am, but I was extremely skilled even back then. But the move to a new profession was so dramatic that I stopped drawing for a while. If I did any cartoons, it was solely for business. 
I draw cartoons for a website, for the blog, for books, for courses. Not one pencil stroke was for my own happiness. And it's not like I didn't know I was unhappy. I'd walk into galleries and I'd turn to Renuka and say, you know, I want to do something similar one day. And yet that day kept getting pushed further and further and further out all the time. In a world where monetization and likes are worshipped, it is hard to do anything for the sake of it. Plus, we still have to earn a living. But this particular measure of success can't be put up forever. Once the business starts to take its wobbly steps, you have to somehow go, wait a second, there's me as well. There is the person that I used to be, the things that I used to do. Maybe you like to read, maybe you like to garden, maybe something that brought you great joy. For me, it was watercolor classes, it was badminton, it was photography, and that's kind of what we do. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. What did we cover? Three things. The first thing was about free time, about how to carve out that free time for yourself. The second was about money being treated like oxygen. There are three sets of people, those who are always gasping for air, those who are always gasping for air, and the one in between. I think we should aspire somehow to be the one in between. And finally, it's about hobbies, about reclaiming who you were as a person, whatever brought you joy at some point in time, and now you've forgotten about it, or it's been crowded out by everything else. So those are the three things that we covered. What's the one thing that you can do today? I think the one thing that you can do today is to go to that first point, which is about free time. The reason why we start up in business is because we want more control over our lives. We want more time for ourselves, for the hobbies, to create products and services that we want, but also to just do nothing, to just lie there, do nothing, what we'd call time well wasted. When you look at all of the people on the planet, the unsuccessful ones, the successful ones, and everyone in between, it's always the same thing. Everyone complains about time. Not one of us say, oh, we have loads of money and we have loads of time. Time becomes the overriding factor for all of us. And so that's where I would start. I would go, what am I doing inefficiently? How can I buy more time? Even if my income doesn't increase at this point in time, how can I buy half a day of my time? I would start there. That's just my suggestion. These are our three benchmarks of success. Everybody wants their own benchmark of success, but these are ours, and I hope it helps you. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. Let's find out what's happening in Psychotactics Land. Here we are in November. It's the end of the year already, but I love November because it's my birthday. Well, it's not a birthday, it's a birth week or a birth month. And a few years ago, we went to Mexico and we had the greatest free time ever. I went out, I got my face painted. It's the day of the dead, Dia de los Muertos. And Mexico just comes alive with all of these paintings and activity and candles around the graveyard and may sound pretty somber to you but it's a very joyful time in in Mexico and for my birth week we went lots of places including for dinner with tequila and mariachi and endless singing of Las Mañanitas which is the birthday song in in Mexico they don't sing happy birthday they go Las Mañanitas maybe we can play that we'll find out I'll say bye for now I'm not telling you anything about psychotactics land. I'll just say, come join us in 5000 BC. Business is a very lonely place, and you really need 
some place where you can talk about your business, where you can get a safe space, where people are not competing with each other, but they're helping you. And that's what 5000 BC is all about. So check out 5000BC.com and we'll see you there. I'll say bye for now. Bye-bye.